Well, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 15, last week we made it through Exodus chapter 14, and this week the evening is going to look a little different as you can already um, expect it to. We're actually going to have three different parts of my message. We're going to finish chapter 15 of Exodus, um, and then we're going to go into a time where you can experience some of the worship, worship stations. Then we're going to have a time of really just reasons to celebrate, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then, um, they, and then from there, I'm actually going to introduce many of you, it's been actually really encouraging, have come to me and said, Chad, you say you're going to talk about fasting, but are you really going to talk about fasting? And I always said, yes, I am. It's coming up. And guess what? It's coming up. So um, I will close the gathering with some time focused in specifically on prayer and fasting and to give you other opportunities to engage in the stations. So if you were here last week, or if you listened to it online, um, you know that the title of the message of last week was simply this, Solidifying the Greatness of Yahweh. And what we're going to tack on to that this evening is this, and preparing to tell his story. What does it look like for you to really know and understand the greatness of Yahweh, the greatness of God? Many of us could say that you have had an encounter with the Creator, that I am who I am, that made you kind of sit down or kneel down or stand up and listen to the fact that He is a great God. But the question that you have to then begin to wrestle with is not just walking away and saying, oh wow, Jesus is great, God had this great plan, the Holy Spirit is really cool because I experienced Him in this sort of way, but the question becomes, what do I do with it next? And so I think as you experience the greatness of Yahweh, the next natural step, although it can be an awkward step, is preparing to tell the story of the greatness of God that is displayed in your life. And every one of you is unique. Every one of you has a story. Every one of you, God, is, is intriguing and intentionally engaging with you specifically for specific purposes, and you have a very specific story. And so as you think about your life and as you think about what God is doing to engage you not only with his greatness and the gospel, the question becomes, why is he using you? Because if the ultimate end was for you to just experience life to its fullest and experience eternity, then our existence on earth would be somewhat limited after we accepted Christ into our heart. But there's something significantly eternal about you still being here and being part of what God has in store for others who do not yet know Him. So as you get involved in Exodus 14 and you remind yourself of that and what took place in the greatness of God, we're going to step right in to chapter 15. If you remember, chapter 14 was all about the parting of the Red Sea. Um, and as you think through the parting of the Red Sea, there is no greater movement or influence of God displaying His greatness than what took place that day. We talked a lot about just where the Israelites were, the fact that they were camped out at the Red Sea, the fact that they had looked like they were totally confused, they didn't know where they were going, and that's exactly where God wanted them. And we talked about how in the Eastern religious worldview that it wouldn't have been so awkward or it wouldn't have seemed like such a stupid mistake for Pharaoh to pursue them because Pharaoh had witnessed the chaos and witnessed the disorganization and said, well, this great God that has displayed his glory before must have left his people because look at them. I mean, they look like idiots. And so Pharaoh charges after them with his chariots and a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud that were leading the children of Israel to their destination separates now the children of Israel from Pharaoh's army, giving the Israelites time to pack up. There's a lot of people that were camped out, and you can imagine, just look to the person next to you, how long does it take you to pack to go on a trip? And these people were camped out, and they need to get packed up, and God said, and guess what? You're going behind you, and there's a great sea behind you. And so the waters part through the movement of God through Moses' staff, and the children of Israel walk through the Red Sea, and all on dry land, and then that pillar moves out of the way, and Pharaoh's army sees the people on the other side of the sea, and because they are so filled with pride and arrogance and 
such a desire to destroy or to recapture these people, they charge into the, the dry ground, and when they do, the sea collapses and Pharaoh's army is lost. Now, we got that in a very clear Moses written <coughs> narrative or prose in chapter 14. In chapter 15, which chapter 14 and 15 really need to be read together, and as you read them together, chapter 15 is different. Chapter 15 is the spontaneous, celebratory, poetic, hymn-type version of the account that we took place, that we read about in chapter 14. That's Moses bursting out into song, and you can think of his rich background, both among the Hebrew people as well as the Egyptian storytellers, that somehow his culture and his connectivity to creativity, which is kind of funny that tonight is an alternative worship night, is a way for him to express the greatness of God in poetry, in creativity, in a hymn type of thing. So when we read Exodus chapter 15, you need to read it as it is. It is a song. It is a song that we'll read about in a second. Was was sung generation upon generation upon generation of the greatness of God. Chapter 15, starting in verse 1, says this. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. I want to pause there because I want you guys to get into this. So you've already read and been through chapter 14. You know the story. So as you hear this celebration, this singing of a song, allow the words that Moses is reminding us, uh, us of in this song to get your blood flowing, to get your excitement going, to get your, hey, my team has just won, and God, the greatest coach ever, has just brought us to a victory. I mean, think of it in that kind of celebration. So be there, get there, whatever it takes. If you need to get up and jump up and down, you can do that. Um, no one will say anything, I promise. <laughs> Verse 4. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my desire shall have its fill of them, I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them, they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Pains have seized the inhabitants of Felicia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone. So your people, O oh Lord, pass by. So the people pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O oh Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O oh Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. 
For when the horses of Pharaoh with the chariots and the horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with the tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider, he is thrown into the sea. What is she singing? Go back to verse 1. She's teaching all the women of Israel the song that Moses just penned, the hymn that he just so absolutely divinely, which was inspired deep within his soul to express the greatness of God. We're going to get through many of the things that we see in chapter 15, but let it be such a wow. I mean, the fact that Angela even started her initial, this is what the evening looks like, by celebrating what God has done in her family. That's what Moses is doing. Celebrate. Look at the greatness of our God and be prepared through this song to tell of his story among the nations. As you think about your story, and as you think about God's greatness, how is he equipping your story to be told literally among the nations, among all peoples, among friends that you deal with day in and day out that are fun and enjoyable and at the same time annoying and frustrating, and yet they are people who do not yet know Jesus. And has God put you in that place to celebrate the greatness of God so that those friends can watch you and can ask questions of you and can be ready for you to tell them of the glory of the gospel. And that's what we find in chapter 15. It was a song that grew to define a generation. It's really interesting. I'm actually getting old. It's kind of weird. I'm midlife, and it seems strange. When I look in the mirror, I don't feel like I'm midlife, but I guess I am, and I don't want to hear any comments on whether I look it or not. But as I think about it, I look at the history of my experience in the church, and as I look at the history of my experience, Passion just took place in Georgia, Passion 2012. Well, I remember when Passion just started. I was actually, um, I knew one of the guys that was part of the initial phase of Passion, Jeff Lewis. He's a teacher at CBU now. He used to come to our campus at New Mexico State and talk about God, and we were just floored by his wisdom. And as he talked about God, he started talking about, we're going to have this thing, Passion 95. And I just couldn't believe that, whoa, 95, and what was going to go. But what was happening with Passion is it was an awakening of worship. There was this awakening that what is it going to look like for college students around the world to be awakened with God's glory. And if we get awakened by God's glory and His majesty and His greatness and the fact that He is worth worshiping, then God will do something among a generation. And so as you think about the movement of passion and now the leaders of passion have taken that worship part and the greatness of God and it has moved and it moved from worshiping God to missions. I mean, there was a huge movement among college students. In fact, it was reached all the unreached by the year 2000. There was a book called Reaching the Unreached by the year 2000. And here we sit in 2012 and there are still people groups and there are still nations and there are still tribes and others who have yet heard the name of Jesus. They've never been exposed to the gospel. And so on this, on the coattails of worshiping a great and mighty God, another movement awoke in a generation to say, we need to reach the world with the gospel. And as you watch this continue to go, there's been an awakening in the church. And now, more than ever, church planting is stressed in ways that I, I never even heard of church planting when I was a kid. I grew up in church my whole life. In youth ministry, I never heard one person say, I'm going to go plant a church. Never. It was never even part of the DNA of churches. But now, as you think about churches, you hear all the time people are going to start churches. And so there's this idea of God's greatness and a mission mobilization. And the church needs to be vitally new and experiential and get people involved in reaching their neighbors and reaching their cities for Christ. And in Passion 2012 this year, you heard me even talk about it as many of you went to the Abol um, Abol Abolition. Yeah, that's right. Abolition Conference. 
Anyway, and if you went to that and you think through it, that 27 million people are currently captive in modern day slavery. And Passion 2012, one of the biggest highlights that they had, one of their main motivations was this generation to get serious about actively engaging to get rid of slavery in 2012. And so you can watch the movement of God throughout the generations. And you can obviously go way before 1995 to see God moving in extraordinary ways among people and countries and nations and generations. And when we read Exodus chapter 15, it was a song that grew to define a generation. In fact, you see the same song being sung in Revelation. Revelation chapter 15, verse 3 says this. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. You see the connection, the beauty, the glue of Scripture, the fluency of Scripture, that this song of Moses goes all the way to the vision that John has about what will the end of the world, the end of time, Jesus returning, a second coming, what will it look like? And what John sees is a people singing the song of Moses. It's a beautiful example that this song resonated through the hearts of the Hebrew people generation after generation after generation. As you look at chapter 15, you see three parts. This is very common. You'll see it in Psalms as you look and read and study Hebrew hymns or Israelite hymns. You'll see three very distinct parts that come up in chapter 15 and in other hymns that you read that were written through the Hebrew culture. Number one, there's a summons to praise. Let's get ready. Look at the greatness of God is basically the statement. Who is he? Why is he that way? What are the attributes of God? We look through the video. This is what Moses showed in his leadership were the attributes of God. And so that first part, as you read chapter 15, and I challenge you to read it again and again this week, especially as you prepare for what God might be doing in prayer and fasting, for you to be specific and read through this hymn. And as you read through it, ask yourself the question, how can I summon myself to praise a holy and great and righteous and awesome and sovereign God? The second part of this hymn would be reasons. So we know his attributes, we know who he is, but why is he that way? And when you read Exodus 15, you see very clearly, God said to me in that burning bush that he was the creator of all things, and he demonstrated the fact that he's the creator of all things through his warrior-like ability to devastate our enemies. To be the biggest proponent of the Hebrews' existence, to move them in a way, God, you are awesome because their chariots were flooded with water. You are awesome because we had time to pack. You are awesome because we felt so confused and chaotic because we didn't know where we were going. And you opened up the sea. As you think about your life and your story and your existence, God is great. Why are you a display of answering that question? Are you a display of answering the question of God is great and I'm an example of why? Look what God did here. Look what God did here. Look what God did here. Look how I trusted God here. Look how through this devastating experience this happened. As you think through summoning Praise towards God and the reasons to praise. And the third is a recapitulation. Those of you that are in music, you may or may not know this term. It's basically a review or a summary. It's the modified restatement of the exposition following the development section in a sonata form. Those of you that just got your music theory right there, that's what a recapitulation is. So you see... 
Here is God. Here is why He is great. And now let's just talk about it again. Let's just be redundant because God is worth being redundant. Let's celebrate His presence. Let's get excited about who He is. And as you think about your life, do you get excited? Is God telling a story? And are you allowing the brightness and the light of Jesus to push back the darkness of sin and self so that you are an expression of God's glory? It's a beautiful image as you think through Exodus 15. I want to look at a couple things of importance as we finish out chapter 15. The first is found in verse 13. It says, redeeming a people for himself. As you look at verse 13 and as you think about Moses' experience, he says, you have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. God longs to be in the presence of his people. He selected a people for himself so that he could demonstrate his power so that the nation would know Yahweh, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Chad, the God of Kaya, the God of Andy, the God of Sarah, the God of Caleb. As you think through your mind and your heart and your experience of God, is God enjoying the intimacy that he longs for in his relationship with and as you think through that, allow that to take your heart captive. John 14, 3, this is Jesus speaking, and this is what he talks about, his desire for you to be in his presence. And Jesus says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus is ascending into heaven, and he's looking at his people, and he's thinking, man, I'm going to return. There's going to be a time where I'm not here, but I'm going to return. And the reason I'm leaving is I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I come again, I will receive you unto myself so that where I am, in all of eternity, at the right hand of God, you are going to be there too. What an amazing time to celebrate. An amazing reflection on Exodus 15 as Moses declares... God, you have redeemed a people for yourself. It's a beautiful expression of the closeness that Yahweh desires for his people. We also find not only this movement of redemption, but we also find three great biblical themes. So the first thing to think of is just this movement of redemption. The second is actually found in three areas we find three great biblical themes in Exodus 15. The first is God's creation of people. The second is God's eternal, holy dwelling place for that people. God intentionally made humanity because he desired to walk the garden with them. I mean, if you think about the experience that Adam and Eve had with God, it is unlike any other human experience ever. Other people have walked with God, but not the way that Adam and Eve did. And we once again will walk with God in heaven, but man, just think about the theme of Scripture, that God created people. This, this should blow your mind. The, the creator of the universe created you to walk next to you and to enjoy each other's presence. The second thing is God's eternal holy dwelling place for that people. That after corruption entered into Adam and Eve and after sin began to devastate creation and devastate humanity, there was an absolute need from the beginning of time. Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit knew that Jesus would have to come born of an infant and sacrifice his life to give himself as a ransom so that you and I could experience this great biblical theme of God's eternal holy dwelling place for those people that have been adopted into his kingdom. 
That not only does God desire for you to walk shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand, arm in arm with him, and to have deep conversation, deep communion with the creator of the universe, but he is preparing a place for you. He wants you to experience not only the fullness of life as you walk this earth, but the fullness of eternity. And then finally, the third thing, the eternal reign of God, supreme over all things. What you find in Moses' celebratory hymn is you find that God created us for a purpose. That God created us for a purpose and will sustain that purpose throughout eternity. And last but not least, God, through his great biblical theme, number three, his eternal reign is supreme over all things. No one else will gain a victory over God. He's the man. And all of creation and all nations, whether they want to or not, at one point will bow their knee and their head and celebrate the greatness of God. The New Testament develops that last theme in a much greater capacity. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17 say this, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Why did God create you? Why is God pursuing you? Why does God want you to be his child, to be part of the family? Romans, through Paul's words, inspired by the Spirit, says this is why. We are his children, and if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs with God and fellow heirs with Christ. As we walk the same path as Jesus, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. I mean, there's so many passages in scripture that say this is the life of a disciple. Deny self and follow me. And there's so many others as you think through but how does your life celebrate the greatness of God? And how are you preparing to tell that story to other people as Jesus told that story to other people? And you should already know that some people that you tell this story to are not going to like the content of the story. It's what nailed Jesus to the cross. They didn't like it. And there's going to be people who don't like you because you stand up and say, I am a child of but eternity is still worth it. And that is the great theme of Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. It's sobering, but it's reality. And God wants a people for himself to declare his glory, to make his name great among all Peoples. Finally, Revelation chapter 22, verse 5. And night will be no more. There will need no light of land or sun, for the Lord God will be their light. And they will reign forever and ever. It's a glorious finish of Jesus returning. Darkness no more. That the presence of God in our lives will be all that we need to sustain us in complete and total and eternal light. It's a beautiful image as we celebrate this hymn of Moses. One last point before we move on with the evening. As we finish, it very simply in verse 20, verse 20 says, Then Mary, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron. Now, who is Mary? You guys should know this from way on back in Exodus. Aaron is Moses' what? Brother. And Miriam is then what? Moses' sister. Now, why doesn't Scripture just say that? Because Moses is writing it. Well, it has all to do with you give credit to the oldest, right? Aaron is the oldest. And so as Moses, the younger brother, is writing about his family, it is culturally appropriate not to say Miriam, the sister of Moses, was looking me on that girl writing this. It's giving respect and saying, no, Aaron's actually my older brother, and the way we do things in our culture is the older one gets the respect before the younger one, and so that's why, very simply, Moses says, Miriam, the sister of Aaron. 
But nevertheless, this is Miriam, who was also where when Moses was taken by um, one of Pharaoh's women of the court. She's the one that saw it happen and ran up to her and said, Hey, I have a Hebrew nurse that can come and take care of this child until you're fully ready to have. And so Moses' mother was able to bring her up, Miriam, and that young child was able to hear the voice of God and to move in absolute action, no matter the risk. And here we find Miriam again. This is the only other time we've seen her mentioned in this whole story. Here she's mentioned again. And what is she doing again? She's opening her mouth and celebrating the greatness of God. And she's doing it corporately. She is teaching and moving and leading and bringing the full profession of faith among the Hebrew people to this glorious movement of celebrating through worship. In fact, it's really interesting that one of the first main worship leaders in all of Scripture is what? A female. It's really cool. In fact, when I read this, I just got super pumped at the role that Angela has as second line. That she leads us in worship. That God has asked her to equip us and to move us and to celebrate the greatness of God through music and through song and through experience. And we, guess what, are being biblical by her doing it. It's an amazing example of what God does among his people. As Miriam leads out, she can't contain herself to express the glory of God among her people. So as we transition into a time where you guys are going to go into your stations, I want you to ponder these questions as we finish chapter 15. How do you engage in a lifestyle of worship? As you think of worship, as you think of the greatness of God, whether it be in your conversations, whether it be in your approach to your academics, the way you're a good employee or employer, how do you, through your lifestyle, in an expression of who you are, worship the greatness of God? And as you ask that question to yourself in terms of engagement, then have you accepted the reality that God is concerned for your eternity? That it's not just about here and now, it's not just about the good job or the bad job or the right place to live or not. All of those things are details that I still believe God is absolutely wanting to be part of. But he wants you to gain the perspective of eternity. And so as you think through Moses' impromptu celebration that takes an entire generation by storm, have you accepted the fact that God is concerned with your eternity. Now is the time for you. You're the only one that's going to be able to make this next part of time what it needs to be as you move to the stations. So um, there should be enough to kind of spread out and to take in what's going on. There's actually four different stations. Um, you're going to have another time this evening to engage, so you don't have to feel like you have to go to all four. Um, you can just hang out at a couple, um, if you get some stuff and then come to your seat and work on it and then go back to it, whatever you need to do. But now is the time for you to experience worship as God leads you through the different